那接下来呢，即将进行的是今天上午的主题演讲环节。首先呢，与大家共同分享的主题是沉浸内容的分发与展映。And next, let's move on to the presentation: a distribution and exhibition map for immersive content. 我们也将掌声有请到的是威尼斯电影节 VR 策展人 Liz Rosenthal 来为我们给出这样的一个主题演讲。And I'd like to invite curator of Venice Film Festival CEO of Power to the Pixel, Liz Rosenthal, to give us a speech. Let's welcome. Hello everyone, good morning, and um, well done for getting here at 10 o'clock, because um, I know you were, some of you were out very late last night. Um, so I, um, as I was introduced, I'm the curator of Venice Film Festival's immersive content section and marketplace. Um, I started my uh, career in the independent film world, um, and I got very excited about how um, digital tools and interactivity could change the way that uh, stories and screen stories were told and how we engage audiences in new ways. So I started a company called Power to the Pixel in 2006 um, where I was looking at new forms of um, storytelling, new ways of doing business and I had two main programs. I had a lab where we um, we incubated, we, we helped producers uh, with over 100 uh, projects, um, so developing 100 interactive and immersive projects. Um, and I also ran the first um, interactive project finance market that was part of an event I ran called uh, Power to the Pixel, um, which was in association with London Film Festival um, over 10 years. So it was really interesting. Um, when you're working in new formats, What's really difficult as a producer, obviously, is there's no established um, distribution ecosystem. And often you are in this R&D mode where you're very concentrated on um, producing something that's really complex. Um, so it's an artistic piece, you're using new technology, um, and often you don't focus on audiences. And this is something I think is um, incredibly important because we have to sustain, of course, um, this new exciting um, form and I think it's something I found that makers often don't do at the beginning of the development process and I think it's pretty important just not from a sustainability point of view but also from a creative point of view because um, mapping out um, how people are engaging with new forms is really important at the beginning of the development process it's going to inform how you develop your project. So that's what I want to do today, is to give a very um, brief and general overview about how uh, immersive formats um, are reaching audiences, um, who are some of the players, um, and how uh, we're starting to try and monetize the content. So, as we know, um, immersive storytelling has come a long way over five years. Um, it's evolved really from something that was hidden in university um, research departments to um, works of art and entertainment now that are featuring in major film festivals, um, arts venues, museums, and theme parks around the world. So, um, this is what. Oh, let me just move on. Oh, sorry, I just realised. I'm sorry, I'm reading notes on my laptop and I've got a clicker and I get confused between on and offline. So sorry. Um, so um, until recently, um, financiers of immersive content were mostly in experimental mode, investing uh, mostly in short form content. And um, it was either to kickstart the industry, um, to showcase their technology or hardware, um, and in the case of traditional media industries such as film and television, to learn about the new medium and how it affect their core business. Um, so, what people were showing in festivals were mostly prototypes before, and the most common deal for any content that was financed took the form often of funding in exchange for a window of exclusivity on a hardware manufacturer's uh, or distributor's storefront. Um, and often people didn't think about uh, wider distribution, and profit wasn't really um, a clear driver. But now um, the industry is trying to rapidly professionalise and proving that return on investment and um, we have some kind of audience reach are becoming a much more important factor 
when people are making decisions about financing content. Um, so I've mapped out, uh, in a very basic way, obviously two main ways that people are, um, where the platforms sit. So through online platforms, um, for entertainment consumed at home and on mobile, and for out of home um, distribution, for, so location based on entertainment, LBE. And I'm gonna give you some examples of uh, projects that are mostly from um, North America and Europe um, that are starting to think about um, different types of platforms or are showing all these different types of locations. So just um, before we look at the specifics of each platform, um, it's just important to go back to what we mean by immersive content. And I know this is something we talked about yesterday in the storytelling um, summit, but um, I wanted to go back to basics before uh, we start moving through those platforms. So I um, define immersive content in terms of four different types of realities. Um, So the first one, of course, is real reality, which we uh, experience with our five senses. The next um, is augmented reality, um, where 2G digital information is layered over our physical world, so on a mobile or tablet screen. Um, the most famous example of this, of course, is uh, Pokemon Go. Um, but in terms of quality storytelling, I think there haven't been that many uh, projects that have come out. Um, but I just wanted to make, uh, to underline two recent examples uh, that appeared in festivals. So first, The Dial by Peter Flaherty, which was shown in Sundance last January, which uses projections as well as augmented reality to stage a uh, mystery. So the action takes place around a projection mapped um, sculpture of a house on a table inside a glowing cube. Um, and three participants use um, their phones to interact with the projection that unravel the mystery. The next one is uh, a project called East of the Rockies, um, which was um, funded out of Canada by the Canada Media Fund and the National Film Board of Canada and showcased at ITFA. Um, so it's written by a very famous Canadian author called Joy Kagawa. Um, and it's, told, it's a story told from the perspective of Yuki, um, who's a 17-year-old girl forced from her home to live in a Japanese internment camp during the Second World War. So I'm just going to give you a very brief taste of what that looks like. Your experience of using glasses allowing you to go around and interact with three dimensional objects that are superimposed into the real physical world. Um, so, examples you talked about uh, were HoloLens and Magic Leap, um, that both developed, uh, have both launched their developer versions um, and are still not in the hands of consumers. So, entertainment and artistic projects are still prototypes. And, um, 
you know, we're right at the beginning of um, developing those kind of stories. It's really exciting, but there are loads of issues to get through, like um, in terms of field of view, so it's quite small still, um, what you can see through the screen, and um, light control. So I just wanted to show you a quick trailer um, of something that came out for the first Hollow Lens because it's an um, interactive story um, called Fragments. Um, so everything from the characters to the items um, you inspect are world aware. So that means they know where they stand or position themselves around the furniture in the room that's shown in this uh, trailer. Sorry. So I'm in my living room, I took the hollow lens home for the weekend. I'm sitting there and I look over to my right and I see the director, Kirkland. And she's sitting there on the couch you know, telling me to solve the mystery. And I'm just like, okay, this is awesome. And I can't even begin to imagine what we could do with storytelling and with games with that new power of having people in your space, in your home. Fragments is this high-tech crime drama, one of the initial applications that we're releasing with the development edition of HoloLens, where you become the main character and solve mysteries that are just brought to life by the world. Investigating the death of Jacob Baker. One of the key things on HoloLens is the world around us. As we scan the room, we exactly know where the walls are, where the ground is, where the tables are. Whenever we know all the information about the room, it starts looking for different points where a character could put his hand on the against. When you're playing Fragments now, we're able to put things like, you know, a thumbprint on a matchbook that we hide behind the coffee table. So you actually have to physically get up and find that pivotal clue and solve the mystery. So three Magic Leap projects were showcased at Sundance um, this year, and the one that gave me a glimpse of the potential um, of the form was a project called The Jester's Tale um, by a young director called Asim Malik. Um, it was financed by Riot Studios, and it integrates um, robotic avant-garde pop star Poppy um, into a mixed reality um, telling of a really scary kid's fable. Um, the place is viewers in a child's bedroom uh, where you need to um, be cast with character holograms. Um, it's about a 12-minute storyline. Um, the other projects were projects um, that were collaborations with Magic Leap, um, who were manufacturing the headset. Um, but so Mika, um, it's an AI-driven mixed reality avatar, and a Royal Shakespeare Company uh, project, The Seven Ages of Man, which is a volumetric capture of a speech from Shakespeare's As You Like It. And we're kind of excited in Venice, we hope we're going to have a couple of projects to show, but this is really um, early still in terms of storytelling. And of course there's virtual reality, which I don't need to go into much details about, because many of you know not a lot about it. Um, but of course, I tend to sort of, when I'm talking about VR, um, I tend to split um, types of forms into what kind of headsets we're talking about. So either three degrees of freedom, um, where headsets where you're passively watching a 360 um, image, um, and or six degrees of freedom headsets, which enable you to be immersed and, and freely move around to participate in the story. Um, so I'm basically going to be speaking about VR in this presentation because that's um, the form that uh, is the most developed and um, where there are the most distribution avenues at the moment. Um, apart from, the, obviously I mentioned um, AR um, and there are many different forms of things happening on phones but when it comes to sort of artistic and entertainment projects that's what I'm going to be concentrating on now. Um, so going through the, uh, before I go through those different routes of distribution, um, I'm just going back to headset sales, um, because this is a report published by CSS Insight. Um, it's back in the end of 2018, um, so, but I still think it's quite relevant. So only 26 million devices have sold in total since 2015. Um, 8 million were sold in 2018, and they're expecting 14 million in 2019, and 52 million in 2022. Um, so in terms of VR, you know, this is really small when you're thinking about global um, levels, so we can't really, um, when we're talking about projects and people are talking about um, business plans, I think it's really hard to talk about success in terms of numbers now um, with headset sales. 
Um, so smartphone VR accounted for most of the sales until um, last year when they started to dwindle. And of course, uh, CSS predicts that the standalone devices, um, such as the Quest, which have just come out, um, are going to be the main driving force uh, for adoption in the next few years. And they expect gaming still to remain the primary driver of sales. Um, and they say that 70% of consumers who own a dedicated VR headset um, have bought games for it. So in terms of um, MR, CSS states that the main use of these devices um, continues to be in business operations. However, um, they believe it's going to take some time for the device market to grow and they don't expect sales to reach 1 million until 2021. Um, uh, but they do think if there's a brand when Apple comes into market, it's going to change very fast. So many of the headset manufacturers are predicting that the magic, magic formula will be mainstream content. So for example, Oculus launched three-part Star Wars series, Vader Immortal with the launch of Quest. Um, but we need much more high quality content um, and a variety of different types of content to, um, and also something I feel very strongly about is curation on the storefronts, because I still feel that's something that's very limited. So at the moment, there's no critical mass, um, and it's in, in, the, in the home, so of course people are, um, are, are, we're looking very much, when I show you that map, and we're going to go through it, at location-based entertainment. Um, and until um, the headsets are um, more desirable and easier to wear and easier to use, um, it's still going to be tough to hit the consumer market and of course until they're ubiquitous in our lives. And Ted has obviously started showing us the kind of headsets that are coming out um, that are starting to look more and more like um, either fashion wear or things that are unnoticeable. Um, and um, soon, you know, when we have those mixed reality, mixed reality devices, um, which are ubiquitous in our lives, um, like our mobile phones, um, and they become um, everyday media and entertainment platforms as well as communication devices, it's all going to change. Um, and they'll be activated by eye tracking and gesture, and we're eventually be replacing um, keyboards. So, um, I want to undermine though that VR and immersive technologies have not failed, um, they're well on their way to success. They're already um, multi-million uh, dollar ventures. Um, but when it, you know, when it comes to emerging technologies, um, Gartner's hype cycle um, is a really uh, good indication of what's working. Um, and despite the fact that you know you read in the press, oh, VR's not working, um, in the enterprise sector, um, it's, uh, you know, it's incredibly, there are many, many businesses that are doing really well. Um, and in 2017, Gartner um, already said that VR was out of the um, trough of disillusionment. So in Gartner, what happens is there's, um, when there's a new technology that comes into the market, um, there's a hype for the technology. Um, and um, then what happens is a lot of the tech sinks into what's called the uh, trough of disillusionment. Um, and some of the tech never comes out of the trough or it goes slowly on the slope of enlightenment when it's adopted um, gradually. So VR was off that slope in 2017, um, well, it's up, and you can see that um, augmented reality is down on the bottom there. Um, so in the enterprise sector, obviously, um, it's being used in the medical field, um, in psychology, and things like pain treatment, and simulation, and all kinds of industries. And it's been used as a mechanism to prototype nearly every vehicle that's been made over the last um, two decades, and many more uses. Um, and it's interesting looking at the kind of content and the crossover of content that's happening between the creative world and the enterprise world. I'm on the board of something called Immerse UK, which is a um, cross-industry network in the um, in the UK. And I, uh, you know, I, I um, spend time with people in different industries. And it's so interesting looking at some of the content they're making that I think we can learn from them and they can learn from us. But going back to the entertainment world, um, a business system is starting to um, emerge 
and uh, we're starting to see different opportunities for revenue generation. Um, international distribution companies, some from traditional media areas, are starting to set up um, new ventures. So French distribution company MK2, um, who are, are an important cinema owner and film financier and sales agent in France, started acquiring and licensing VR projects over a year ago. Um, there's a company called Diversion Cinema, a French VR cinema and LP servicing company. They launched a distribution arm last year. And um, obviously there was news last year at the Sundance Film Festival when a project um, Spears um, won, um, which uh, won our Grand Jury Prize in Venice last year. It was acquired um, by a new distribution and licensing company, City Lights, for $1.4 million. But unfortunately, we haven't had any news like this um, this year. And it kind of made me laugh because I come from the independent film world and um, reading the Variety reports from Sundance, uh, this was in 2018, was kind of funny because in Sundance is a place where uh, there's always a few films where there are bidding wars with distributors, and suddenly this made a big headline like, Film World's dead, VR's come. Um, and so sometimes these headlines aren't very helpful because then obviously people, you know, a few weeks later, um, sort of say, VR's dead. So we're up in this kind of up and down situation where things are changing. But there are new companies coming into the world, and I was really excited to um, hear about some different companies here who were working as uh, distribution companies. Um, so there's one uh, that I didn't put on my slide, um, Iconic Engine, um, which are part of uh, digital domain and they're licensing to telecom companies now. So these are just um, some of the um, ways that you can uh, maximise exploitation and audience reach. Um, so it's really important when you're doing any kind of plan for distribution and licensing. It's a careful balancing act of different platforms and windowing. So it's very similar to how the traditional film and television uh, world works, where you have to work out how you launch um, your project, um, where you premiere it, and how you license it. So um, it could be platform specific, or it could be territory, um, or continental territory specific. Um, but it's very important that you pay attention. Now all the people are starting to treat this as a proper, proper sort of like licensing business, um, and that, you, um, that free exhibitions don't interfere with potential acquisitions. So at the moment, electronic sell-through and um, location-based entertainment licenses are the most common models. Um, and you know, in the future, we'll see ad-based, um, so AVOD um, deals, um, and subscription deals um, that will start to emerge. But yeah, ESD and LBE are the most common at the moment. So going back to this, which is the important bit. <laughs> so I'm going to run through the different platforms um, of exploitation now, and I've divided these into the two main areas. Um, so starting with at home and mobile, so many publishing brands started to distribute stories that the news, current affairs, travel, lifestyle, culture. Um, many create their own um, IPs, and they often acquire but rarely fund third-party projects, and user accessibility and attracting new audiences is really the goal, not direct revenue generation. Um, content's mostly available through their branded apps. Um, so these are just some um, examples. Um, the Guardian in the UK uh, made 13 projects, um, but they were financed through a deal with Google Daydream. Um, this was the last project, Songbird, um, which was um, a story about the legendary OO bird um, before it became extinct. Um, it's available on 360 and there's an interactive version of 5. Um, but they're these kind of like um, financing projects is often in conjunction with a deal that the media outlet makes with a headset manufacturer. Um, so this one has come to an end. At the moment they made 13, 13 great projects um, that were published on their website. Um, another example of a studio that's working and that's very well known in the VR space is Felix and Paul. Um, they had a project in Sundance um, called Travelling Wild Black. Um, that was financed through the New York Times. So the New York Times has um, had many different 
um, initiatives for uh, VR, and this came from their Opdoc section, which um, is their opinion piece, a media commissioning um, division, and they usually do flat screens with documentary video, so um, this might have been the first project that came out of that part of the New York Times. So it's quite hopeful when it's a storytelling commissioning that's coming into the, um, that's starting to commission work like this. Sorry, I didn't have time to go through all the um, examples, um, so I'm going to run a bit over. So in the uh, broadcaster world, it's mostly public service broadcasters um, who've entered the space. Um, like the publishers, uh, user, ex user accessibility and attracting new audiences um, is key because um, the public service broadcasters, a lot of them in Europe, their average um, age range of viewers is now, um, I think it's around 55, I would say as a general, so they're very concerned about how they're going to attract new audiences. So they're always trying out, I know in the interactive storytelling world, um, they were looking at web ideas now, uh, VR. Um, again, you know, it's not about direct revenue, it's about um, trying to engage new audiences with their media brands. Um, content is basically free, um, mostly 360 video available across all three basic freedom devices. Um, exceptions of uh, broadcasters who've done um, work that's produced for higher end test sets at BBC, Arte, and um, Sky, which is a private channel. Um, so they mostly distribute work they've commissioned or produced in the house. Um, However, some broadcasters um, are wanting to increase their libraries, so they are acquiring content sporadically. So these are some examples. Um, many projects are attached to existing TV IPs. So for example, Gomorra um, is something that was financed by Sky Italia, and it was to link season one and two of the hit TV series. Um, some um, of the public service broadcasters like Arte and BBC are creating um, digital native work, but this was um, Doctor Who, which is showing in some box. Um, it comes out of the VR Hub. I know uh, Zilla's here, she'll talk about um, that I think later today. Um, so that, that's to coincide with the new Doctor Who series, uh, which is our long, longest running TV drama in the world. Um, Discovery, which is a private channel, um, has uh, has, has mount, is mounting a very large scale 38 episode travel documentary series. Um, Discovery is collaborating with uh, Google on this, the Google's VR group, um, and um, to, it launched in August 2015. The Discovery VR app has been downloaded 4.3 million times um, and generated more than 123 million views. So um, obviously this is very themed around travel, something that's a, um, a successful genre for um, 360 video. So there are a variety of online platforms um, that distribute VR. I'm not going into them. I know there are many uh, interesting new companies in China that I haven't uh, mentioned here, but I'd love to learn more about, so please come and talk to me. Um, so the curated platforms, um, a pre-sale or acquisition requires um, usually no talent or a claim from festivals and will generally uh, require a window of exclusivity. So if a platform offers to distribute your content without money, um, without paying a fee um, or a minimum guarantee, um, it's normal not to give any exclusivity um, unless they're offering you something really huge in terms of marketing or something else um, of value. And the revenue split is generally 70-30. Um, so there's going to be uh, more opportunities coming as more players like cable and telecom operators come into um, the market. So this is something is Antoine here. Is Antoine Carroll here? So this is something that Antoine Carroll, who's the um, co-founder of Atlas Five, um, um, talked about recently in terms of the deals he's doing. So he's doing quite premium content, like Spears have got. Um, and Battlestar, they've got well-known um, vo actors voicing um, the characters. Um, so he said that the, a platform pre-sale um, for a six-month exclusive window, he was expecting a six-figure sum. Um, for continental exclusivity acquisition, so after the project's been made, five figures, continental non-exclusive deal, four figures, and um, a revenue share non-exclusive 70-30 split in favour of the producer. 
So sorry, I know I'm running a bit over. Um, how long have I got to go through? Two minutes, I've only just started. Okay, I'm going to go really quickly with this. These are just some of the, um, the I wanted to show you some of the price points um, from projects, um, well known projects that um, we showed at Venice last year. Sorry, they're in pounds. Um, and it's just to give you an idea of um, what things are selling at. So Spears, which we've won our grand jury prize, um, which is 45 minute pieces around um, $9. Um, Rainbow Crow, um, which is a premium piece, is free. Um, Great Sea, which is around 30 minutes, again about $5.99. Uh, so just um, in terms of uh, location-based entertainment, so the industry is predicting this will be the best way to monetize VR in the next two years, while the headset sales are very uh, small still. Um, so it, it solves many of the problems and limitations of the hardware at home. So um, it enables to create an appetite for audiences and also for people to see things they couldn't possibly see at home, which are multi-person, multi-sensory worlds that you enter into with incredibly complex technology. Um, so the venues are spread in all kinds of places, anywhere where um, there's something that, um, you know, we're seeing all kinds of venues, um, in cinema foyers, theatres, arts centres, galleries, museums, shopping malls, theme parks, um, that cater for all kinds of genres. So um, the market for this, Green Light Insights, I think you are here and doing the presentation, um, uh, um, say it's, it was worth $1.2 billion already last year and $8 billion by 2022. Um, so the arts and cultural projects, um, I think that uh, selection awards and press reviews from world-class festivals is really uh, essential for the future value of your project. So planning a festival strategy and choosing the best place to premiere your work should be the starting point of any distribution plan. Um, and uh, some festivals that are um, do pay, uh, especially things like performing, performing arts festivals, actually pay revenue fees. Um, not the big festivals, but um, smaller specialist festivals. Um, so there are all kinds of festivals you can launch, but it's really important um, to think about that first place you show your work. So for example, in Venice, um, we were class um, a world premiere of your work, and sometimes we take international premieres. Um, and um, we're trying to, as Michelle talked a lot about Venice yesterday, um, we're trying to create a place where you know, immersive work is seen on the same level as uh, film. And so we have awards, um, a red carpet, and we're trying our hardest to try and cultivate um, press writing about films in the same way they write, uh, write about VR in the same way they write about cinema. So starting some new culture of reviewing work. Um, so moving on to dedicated VR venues, I divided them into three types of locations, VR theatres, VR caves, standalone VR experiences, um, and the third one, VR attractions and free roam. So VR theatres um, usually uh, show programmes for multiple people, and the programmes are up to 30 minutes. Um, generally, that's what we show in our VR theatre in, um, in Venice. Um, the limited they're, they're very limited in terms of permanent venues, um, and um, the kind of distribution deals is very much break even kind of business. One of the theatres I love that I visited last year um, was in Kaijong, um, that the VR Film Lab run. Um, it's really beautifully designed, and it kind of changed my mind about what a uh, VR theatre could be. So if you're going to Taiwan, definitely worth a visit. Um, so most um, arcades uh, showcase games or RP related to brand content. Um, the most common models are pay-for-play um, models, so bundled in time slots of 15, 30, 60 minutes, averaging a dollar a minute. Um, in the cultural sector, we have very limited permanent venues, and this is something that's a real problem. In London, we've got loads of exciting work happening, but we don't have any permanent venue that's been funded through um, the government for this new form of art. It's something I see that's desperately needed in places. Um, and also, um, distribution is a real problem. Distribution, delivery, licensing, um, there are no turnkey systems. But in Cannes, uh, film festivals here, I met with Springboard and VR, who um, have a, uh, they're a licensing and delivery company 
for games and to arcades, and they're starting to get into narrative content. And I think this is going to be very useful for us because it's one of the main issues with projects is a lot of the time it's producers who are having to uh, deal with all of the issues of distribution. So various um, new free road companies have launched with systems allowing users to get as close as they can to walking around inside another world. And I know that you're going to be hearing from someone today, um, Dreamscape, um, which produce some of my favourite work that are um, based out of LA um, and are a partnership um, with Hollywood Studios, AMC Theatres in the States and Steven Spielberg and Walter Parks involved. Um, the Void is another uh, big one that has two um, permanent locations in Disney theme parks and Madame Tussauds in um, New York. And they also uh, showed the Star Wars um, VR project in uh, Westfield in London in the UK. So kind of price point for this experience is a very, very large experience that sits in the middle of the shopping mall. Um, was uh, I'm trying to think of dollars. It's about, it was about $45 for 15 minutes. Um, and we're seeing all kinds of other uh, types of companies spring up. So this, for example, is a company called ER Solve that's got a kind of family solution. It's a pod that you can plant into um, into different kinds of venues, um, and they provide content as well. So all kinds of things in this area. One of the, co the companies that actually is doing really well is Zero Latency. It was a company that came from Australia, um, and they're actually uh, they do sort of large-scale, um, fully-embodied experiences of quite large numbers of people at the same time, and they're kind of more shooter game type experiences, but it's a company that um, is proving that this kind of model for that kind of genre can work. Um, I, do, I want to show you just a clip of a project that I think is um, uh, interesting, because it comes from a small French company called Backlight, who are very clever about how they design their experiences. So one of the issues like something like the void is it takes off a huge amount of space, um, so that's very expensive in terms of real estate. Um, and um, backlight design experiences that have a very small footprint. Um, this is an escape room um, type uh, game for um, four players in two teams at Pichet de Venice. things when you're creating free range experiences um, and Backlight have done this very successfully. Um, so moving on to the next um, slide, um, it, so galleries and theatres are obviously playing a big part in um, art and entertainment pieces. Um, there's a wide range of public funded and private galleries in the space. So, um, we live in a nation of air. It's a project by Marshmallow Laser Feast, which is an example the, in the Saatchi Gallery. It's a very important um, privately owned uh, gallery in London. Um, they licensed the project um, to show, and it was so successful um, that it ran uh, for five months. It was extended. And so the kind of price point for this was uh, 20 pounds. That's about $25, $25 for a 15-minute experience. I think Nell's going to be talking about that later today. Um, another example of a notable gallery is Montreal, the Vice Centre, that do very high-end exhibitions throughout the year of um, top uh, projects that um, curate at uh, festivals. 
And then there are many different, in, in the UK, for example, we have a very strong tradition of theatre. So we see many immersive theatre companies in the space. And one of the big players is the National Theatre, um, who have a digital storytelling lab. Draw Me Close was a project that, was, uh, that we showed and Tribeca showed. Um, and it's uh, an example of a live performance virtual reality um, piece that has an animated style um, by a director called George and Tannehill. Um, so they showed this in London with a part of part of theatre, the old book. It was shown over 10 days. Um, and the hour show ran continuously with a £15 entry fee. Um, and there are many of our public galleries, like the Tate Gallery and the Royal Academy, which is our, which our biggest and um, very well-known galleries, are producing work now, but a lot of it is in-house, um, so they're uh, finding companies to help produce. And it's quite hard to get into these galleries because they tend to plan their exhibitions uh, three, four years in advance. Um, I won't have time to show you this, but I wanted to just show you um, some figures. Um, this is a project called VRI, um, which uh, was, I, I love this project, we showed it in the best of section in Venice. And Chief Chabon, he's a choreographer who made this project, has very kindly shared uh, some of the figures around the project. It's an art piece, it's a choreography piece, but it's a great example of a free roam experience um, that requires a very, very small setup. Um, but it's very effective in terms of uh, what it looks like. Um, so you went to a virtual space with virtual dancers, there are five of you, you're fully embodied um, as an avatar, and it's a really amazing piece to explore movement and body and scale. And it, I've seen it play, it launched in the Festival of the Cinema in Montreal in 2017, and it was actually shown in the shopping mall, and it was kind of exciting to see it because she was a contemporary dancer, and his work's usually shown in very niche festivals, but you could see with a work like this, and how it attracted uh, all kinds of people who'd never go into work like this. So what's interesting about this is it only requires three to four people to tour. It's probably the most toured project that I know of that's shown in the festival circuit that's this complex. Um, it's had 23 bookings, 30 more until 2020. Um, he tours in a whole mixture of festivals and different types of arts and dance venues um, where he has uh, relationships for the last 25 years. So what he's found is film festivals don't pay fees, but dance venues and performing arts festivals do. And he feels that they're going to be the answers to some of these more artistic projects because they're used to um, dealing with performance, which a lot of the projects I'm starting to see in, this, in the programme I'm executive producing um, that's funded by the Arts Council. A lot of the old work I'm seeing has some kind of element of performance in it at the moment. And so performing art, venue, uh, art venues have models. Uh, it's interesting looking at Gilles because he's used to touring and he thinks about how you move as easy as possible. And I think it's really important to be as practical as possible about these things. So um, he says for performing art venues, he's been charging $3,000 a day for the first three days and then $2,000. And these were his um, costs for touring without fees was $20,000. And his global budget for touring was $330,000. Um, and fees invoice were 170 But the difference is made up of touring, public funding, which we have in some um, countries in Europe um, and in Canada. You can raise money from arts councils to do this. Um, so museums are obviously a place uh, where your work is being shown and visitor attractions um, as well. Um, I think a lot of uh, people will put museums in their business plans. They're not so let me back to that. They're not so easy to work with always either because um, they have very uh, the big museums um, like uh, the Smithsonian or the Natural History Museum. They plan their exhibitions free years in advance, um, but I'm starting to see some deals with some very specific genres. So um, there was a project I was looking at, um, there's a space travel project from Canada, and they uh, were licensing the project out to kind of space um, and aeronautical museums, uh, about sort of $50,000 to $70,000 uh, for a license a year, and there are quite a lot of those types of museums. So in certain genres it's working, but I think with artistic projects, I'm, people often say to me, oh, I'm going to go to museums, it's not that easy. Um, 
visitor attractions um, are, I think what's interesting about museums and visitor, visitor attractions is footfall, is the fact there's already a huge audience coming through some of these uh, venues. So something like the Science Museum and the Natural History Museum in London has 5 million visitors a year. Tate Gallery uh, is similar. Um, and we're starting to see all kinds of uh, work happen in theme parks. At the beginning, it was more an overlay for rides, and now we're seeing some native projects like uh, Ghost Train, um, which was uh, a very famous British illusionist called Darren Brown, um, who showed this at, in a theme park called Thought Park. So it's kind of like an interesting, scary storytelling. I'm not going to show you a clip. Um, project um, and it actually is interesting looking at the model because there are 16 people at a time go into a tube train, a physical tube train and then they're in this horror experience and about 780 people go through the experience every hour. Um, so, uh, sorry I just got to move on. Um, and just our places, obviously, Domes and Planetariums um, are places for non-interactive work. And it's um, an exciting uh, project um, that's going to happen in Vegas, one in Vegas and one in London in 2021-2022 is Madison Square Gardens, are building something called the Spheres, which are going to be for 20,000 people, um, audiences. Um, where there be immersive entertainment and art, so they're starting to think about the kind of entertainment that sits in these places. Obviously, public um, spaces and cities, um, we're going to see more partnerships with uh, um, sort of municipal uh, organisations, tourist organisations. The Gruffalo Spotter was something, it was a project with the Forestry Commission in the UK, so it's a very famous uh, property, the Gruffalo, um, and that's a project called a uh, company called Nexus. Um, public spaces that are indoors. So this is a, a great project that the BBC is doing um, in libraries. So they're touring their commissioned work in 120 different libraries in the UK. Um, and then travel is going to be a huge new area for a massive entertainment. Um, so there are things like frame stores filtered to Mars, which was a school bus decked out with screens. Uh, it was for a campaign, but this is growing into a, a property of its own. So this is a headset for this experience. Um, and then there are airlines, for example, which were a big place to sell uh, media. They're starting to uh, show VR on certain airlines. Um, and there are a whole lot of new deals um, we've seen uh, in CES this year with Lyft. Um, and the second one I want to mention is Holoride, a German company who's done a partnership between Audi, Audi and Disney. So that's just a very, very rapid overview. Um, and sorry, it's slightly sort of superficial, but I thought it'd be a useful overview to do before we start the day. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Thank you, thank you, ladies. Thank you for your excellent speech for us.